Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Anglican Church. It's so great to have you here, ready to worship with us. My name is Father Keith Hartzell, and I'm here leading with Father Bill Mugford. And um, it's just a glorious day to worship the Lord. So as we begin our service, um, we're going to begin with our opening processional hymn. Would you stand with me as we begin? the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray this prayer together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Remain standing if you're able to worship with us. Oh 
Lord be with you. Let us pray. Abba, Father, Almighty God, you have opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and steadfast wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, you may be seated for the reading of God's word. A reading from the prophet Amos. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria. The notable men of the first of the nations to whom the house of Israel comes, pass over to Kalna and see, and from there go to Hamath the Great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? O oh, you who put far away the day of disaster and bring near the seat of violence. Woe to those who lie on beds of ivory and stretch themselves out on their couches and eat lambs from the flock and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first of those who go into exile, and the revelry of those who stretch themselves out shall pass away. The word of the Lord. The psalm for today is Psalm 146, Please read by alternating verse. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On the very day, his plans perish. Blessed he is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever. Who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry, the Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind, the Lord lifts up those who are bowed down, the Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God will sign to all generations. Praise the Lord. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. reading from Paul's first letter to Timothy, chapter 6, verses 11 through 19. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness, for the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God, who gives life to all things, and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. 
As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. According to St. Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, child, Remember that you in your lifetime received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may come from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. about this high, would you follow that lady and that little guy? Thank you. <laughs> You've raised a family of comedians. <laughs> They're so good at it. You may be seated. Well, we have a new series. The unworthy become worthy, or how about we unworthy become worthy? Like, how do you get there? How do you go from being a scoundrel to a saint? 
is really the question we're asking. And honestly, it's really all about what Jesus teaches when he talks about transforming us from being scoundrels to becoming saints. How many of you are still scoundrels? Yeah. Yeah. Somehow I knew that there were a few left in here. And, and that's job security for Keith and I, am I right? <laughs> well, I thought this morning I'd take a few minutes and talk about the scoundrel and the saint. How about that? But you kind of need a picture, don't you? Because if we had put a mirror up there, then a few of you could have looked at the screen and you would have had to decide which you were, scoundrel or saint. But I think if we have a picture, that's better. And look at this one. You just heard the story. So where do you think Lazarus is? Down the screen. Okay, bottom left-hand corner. And the other guy doesn't have a name, and it's probably better that way. But where is he? Along with his girlfriend, uh, sitting there up in the sort of middle right. The scoundrel and the saint. Now, who's the scoundrel and who's the saint? This is the challenge. Because in, in Jewish thinking, if you are doing well, you are the saint. And if you are not doing well, you were the scoundrel. But when you read Jesus' story, it feels like he's turned it all around. What's fascinating about this particular passage, and by the way, the second hardest of the two passages in the whole series, and you give them both to me. Um, the, the thing that's hardest about it is trying to decide whether this is a real story or whether it's a parable. And there's a huge debate. If you want to go on the internet, you can get involved in that debate. I mean, really get involved. So, what is it? A parable or a story? I'm going to say that it's likely a story. It doesn't begin like most of Jesus' parables, even though it's sandwiched in with other parables. There are just so many things you can take out of it. Usually a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and you can only take one point out of it. But there's lots of theology here, including flames. So let's see if we can understand this as a story and figure out why Jesus told us the story. So here's the scoundrel. Scoundrels always seem to be on top, don't they? <laughs> David even wrote about this. He says, why is it that the wicked do so well and the saints, well, they struggle. So there was a rich man who was clothed in purple. I mean, would it be any other color? And fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day, he died. <laughs> Welcome to the future. <laughs> Well, then there was the saint. A poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. The dogs licked his sores. Dottie already? Yeah. A little twinge. Look at what it says next. He died. Welcome to the future. You're all facing that all kind of, from the day we were born, in step to fulfill this story. And whether you're a scoundrel or a saint, you die. Now, how would you rather die? A scoundrel or a saint? Please say saint. So they're the same, but they're separate. How do we know that? Well. The story goes on. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. If you're a good Jewish man, that's exactly where you want to be. With Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But what separates these two is the rich man also died and he was buried. That's kind of cold, isn't it? And in Hades being in torment. Whoa. 
Now who would you rather be? You know, I've heard people say over the years, I've had friends who I've played football with and hockey and baseball. And I've, I've had them say, oh, I'm going to go to hell with all my friends. <laughs> Here are two visions of the future. Where would you rather be? I'm sticking with Abraham. Hades, not so much. So let's stop for just a minute and think. Because this is a story about eternal destiny. We all begin the same. But we don't all end the same when it comes to our eternal destiny. And, you know, often we take those passages, especially the ones in the New Testament, and we preach the ethics of the passage, and we don't preach the essence of the passage, which is all of us are on a journey headed in a direction. We work really hard at it. We hope to be remunerated for all that hard work some people are going to look really successful and other people, either by reason of disease or accident or maybe even background, are going to live quite different lives from those who live in purple. We need to stop and think about that because what we do today profoundly influences what happens Tomorrow, and by the way, tomorrow can come really quickly. Your move from this earth to eternity can happen just like that. You know that I was away recently for my brother-in-law's passing. Well, actually, his celebration of life service, he passed like that. Between the time his wife went upstairs to start painting a closet and broke the roller and came down saying, Peter, can you fix this? He was gone. 59. Wow. So I think the first big point is deciding whether you're a scoundrel or a saint, and secondly, stopping to think about that. So what sustains the guy who we've come to know as the saint in this passage. Well, he doesn't have any resources. He's described as poor. He doesn't have any power because he doesn't have any resources. You know how it goes at the parties. People walk through the door, you look at how they're dressed, you see the bag that they're carrying, you look at their shoes and you think, I better go and meet that person or not. That's the way our culture does it. And if you have no resources and no power, you generally have no influence. It doesn't say in the story that people were beating their way to the underside of the table where Lazarus was hoping to get crumbs from the table to meet Lazarus. The only, the only thing that was headed in that direction were the dogs. Don't know why sores taste good to dogs, but. So that leaves the poor person with their only power to trust in God. No resources, no power, no influence, trust God. And that's where the poor man, Lazarus, was really rich. He trusted God and he got to hang out with Abraham. Now, if I had my choice of who to hang out with in heaven, I'm sort of thinking that Jesus is going to be pretty busy. So Abraham, that would be a great place to start. So Abe, what was it like when you were 75 worshiping the moon and suddenly heard the voice of God saying, I'm going to take you away from all this. Are you ready to follow? I want you to leave everything behind. Well, you can bring the stuff that you can move, but 
We're going to go on an adventure. Oh, and by the way, you're going to have a son. And then it doesn't happen for 25 years. Are you ready for a journey like that? You might say, well, maybe not today. So here's the, here's the stunner in all of this. The rich man lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I'm in anguish in this flame. You know, somebody actually wrote a musical about this. And when it came to that last line, I am in anguish. And the guitars are wailing and you're sitting there thinking, oh God, if I'm a scoundrel, I do want to be a saint. This is the reversal of fortune. The wealthy man ends up being poor and the poverty stricken man ends up being rich. So how does that story go? Why is it the way that it is? Well, Jesus tells us in the story, Abraham starts speaking. Child, in your lifetime, you received good things and Lazarus bad things, but now he is comforted and you're in anguish. And between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. That sounds rather final. I mean, read it again. How do you read it? Does that sound rather final to you? It's fixed. The chasm is fixed. Now, you may be thinking at this moment, why did I come here this morning? I don't need doom and gloom. There's enough going on in my world. This is part of the gospel. So there's the story. The way that you live powerfully affects the way that you die and live again. I think it's funny in this story that this is where the rich man begins to pray. And you say, well, how do you know that? Well, because the words that he uses are the words for supplicative prayer. Supplicative prayer is prayer that goes, oh, God, help. And that's exactly what he says. And the rich man said, then I beg you, Father. Send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. That was probably one of the very few days in this guy's life since he became wealthy that he was thinking of others. God at least saved my brothers. You already get the feeling that he is kind of jealous of Lazarus. But please save my brothers. So do you take from this that sometimes it's too late to pray? Seems like it. So making your choices after this kind of sobering event after you hear this sobering event, making your choices is really important. It's sobering because Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. In other words, Abraham, just you know, kind of like show up. Even if you're a hologram, Abraham, it'll, it'll look like a real thing. And he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced that someone should rise from the dead. And what is really being said here? That the rich man's heart is so dead, he didn't listen. And his brother's hearts are so dead, they won't listen. You made your choice. It's too late to pray. 
We're done here. Now, if I had my choice, the things that I want to hear God say, I would like to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, rather than we're done here. And all of this, all of this surrounds what affluence and money can do to your soul if you're not careful. I'm going to go back a few verses to the 13th verse of the same chapter, which we covered last week, because this is really kind of the dominant verse in that chapter. And it says, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and money. You just can't. You can try, but you can't. Now, I don't know about you, but what happens to me when I run into scripture verses like this is they shock me, but I've made a commitment. And I hope you've made the same commitment. That when I hear a verse of scripture that warns me about something, I take it seriously. And I try to conform my life immediately and I try to say, God, if I'm habituated to something else, please help me stop and establish a new attitude and new actions. Because if you don't do that, you keep sort of sparring with God for your whole life. You're, it does something to your soul. The indigenous people in the United States, the, the Indians, talk about the conscience in this way. They talk about the conscience as a square block and a square hole. And every time you offend the conscience, it turns. And in the beginning, the square block and the square hole turning, it is very difficult. But the more you offend the conscience, the more the hole becomes around and there's no resistance any longer. That's what happens to us when we hear messages from scripture or on Sunday, and we don't already have the commitment to obey immediately. It wears on our souls. It wears us out. There's no longer any resistance, not only to that issue, but issues like it. And our whole lives lack both the essence of God and the ethics that proceed from the essence of God. So how do you become a saint from this story? What do you pay attention to? Well, here are some of the words. Forget being sumptuous. Living in purple, not so great. Doesn't mean you're truly rich. Might mean that you're wealthy, but not truly rich. Explore the power of poor. What do you mean the power of poor? You said that they had no power, no resources, no nothing, except the power of poor was what? To trust in God. Here are the prophets. We're getting a prophetic word from Jesus. You're getting a chance to see what your future's like if you don't pay attention to your life now, especially in relation to money. You're getting a, a Jesus view. I don't know what you could get in terms of a better view. Repent. But I'm a Christian. I don't need to repent anymore. <laughs> You know what repent means? Turn around and go in the opposite direction. If you have begun to cut corners on life, and you know, you know that you're headed in the wrong direction, why would you take one more step in the same direction? Turn around. 
And by the way, turning away from sin actually puts you in God's direction. So you're drawing closer to God. That's what repentance is all about. Experience comfort. Now that sounds weird, except remember where that word was found? When Lazarus was in the presence of Abraham. The real comfort, the real hope, the real riches are found with the saints. Get convinced. Make a decision. Decide today. I'm going to use my resources and my power and my influence to trust God, and I'm going to put my resources where my heart is. And I'm not going to turn away from it. Now, if any of us are sitting here this morning and we feel this little sort of uncomfortable feeling in our hearts, pay attention to it. That usually means the Holy Spirit is saying, hello. You've got one shot at this. One shot. Make it a good one. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for all those great passages that fill out our checklists and help us do good. And thank you for stories like this that make us think. And more than make us think, help us act to do something different. Lord, we need your help. Psychologists tell us it takes six times to establish a habit and 39 times to break it. So we have, we have a challenge. Whenever we're confronted by your word and you ask us to change. And we here believe that you have the right to ask us to change. So Lord, in the faithfulness of your Holy Spirit, help us to change. And then help us to see the joy in the change by knowing that when we enter those pearly gates, people like Abraham are going to be waiting for us. But more importantly, Jesus will say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Everybody said, Amen. Because if I'd asked that earlier, you might have said, ouch. <laughs> and, now let, <clears throat> and now let us continue in prayer, responding, hear our prayer. Dear Father, thank you for this sobering lesson in living our lives on earth in the light of eternity. Help us avoid self-indulgence, embracing generosity and compassion. Teach us to see others in every need with kingdom eyes. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. we pray for the poor and the persecuted. Intervene by your spirit and use us to eliminate suffering. Transform sumptuous pursuits into sacrificial compassion. Heal spiritual blindness to see souls in need of a savior. Lord, in your mercy. For all of us in trouble, sorrow, need, or adversity, either here or online, we pray for your grace and mercy. Lighten loads, lift hearts, and give relief for your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, we praise you for everyone who proclaims the gospel at home, abroad, and online. And we pray for all who minister by teaching and discipling others. Lord, in your mercy, 
Give the leaders of our country, cities, communities, and churches hearts for mercy and justice, enabling them to walk humbly with and work wholeheartedly for you. Lord, in your mercy, please add your own prayers and petitions. We offer special thanksgivings today for both Francis and for Jean. God's speed and blessing on their journeys from here. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us sit or kneel if you're able as we confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Confessing together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Receive the forgiveness of the Lord. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Friends, take a moment to greet one another with a sign of Christ's peace. Friends, please be seated for a few announcements. Again, welcome to Grace Anglican Church. Bill and I are so thrilled to be with you all this morning, and we have some fun announcements. If you're visiting with us for the first time, we would love a chance to meet you, one of us, at the end of the service. We'd love to find out a little bit about you and see how we can help you get more connected to the life of this vibrant church family community. We have several events coming up that we think you should take note of. One is today, after the service, we're gonna fellowship over some delicious cake and celebrate Jean and Francis. 
And so um, this is their last Sunday. These are two uh, delightful staff members for those of you that are newer to our community. And uh, they are both moving to um, less than wonderful places like here, um, Connecticut and Arizona. And so we're just gonna miss them terribly. And this is the Sunday that we're gonna celebrate them together right after the service. So plan to stick around a little bit and enjoy some cake and get to know us a little bit better. For those of you interested in getting more involved in the life of our church, there are several opportunities for using your gifts in um, the sacred worship that we do each week. One is we're definitely um, excited about having live musicians in our service and building a music team. And in the absence of Gene, we're gonna need some help with sound or tech. I don't know if any of you have those gifts or desires, but if you are interested, um, we'd love to have you contact Lori Carpenter. Um, her email and phone number are there. We are sending out a newsletter to your emails every week. If you haven't received it, check your spam folder, see if it made its way in there, or we might have your wrong email. So if you haven't seen it the last two or three weeks of emails, uh, we call it Grace Connect of uh, emails, um, please, uh, Talk to Lori and get your correct email to her so that we can make sure that you stay in the know on how to be involved. Also, um, uh, one other that, uh, opportunity that's not up there um, is uh, Yvonne is interested in any new Altar Guild helpers, anybody who'd like to volunteer for Altar Guild. Um, you can also uh, let Lori know or go right to Yvonne. She loves everything around setting up the table, the linens, the candles, the communion. And then, of course, um, Don Hartzell, my wife, in coordinating the children's ministry time during our service, is interested in helping anyone who loves to interact with children uh, to be involved in on a, on a rotation with the children during the service. And um, there are also opportunities to serve the children without interacting with the children. If there are things that you'd like to do, um, some of us love interacting with children, some of us may less love interacting with children. <laughs> so um, our uh, once a year diocesan synod is coming up. It is in uh, October. Uh, we don't have the dates up there, do we? No, we do, in small letters, October 20, to 22, it's just 30 minutes up the road in Mission Viejo, and it's at the Presbyterian Church of the Master, and it's a wonderful time of gathering. I think it only costs $25 to register, and you get fed, and you get incredible training, and you get to fellowship with some of the wonderful folks that are scattered around our diocese. Um, so I encourage you to register at the website, westernanglicans.org, um, to be a part of that Synod weekend with all of us together. Bill. Should you want to call some friends up to the front? I do. So, Jean, come on up. And Francis, this was the only way that I could do this. If I asked them ahead of time, they would not have done it. They probably would have stayed home from church. <laughs> They're both nodding. Yes, they would. Have. Okay. My good friend Francis here, otherwise known as Boots and Hat. Um, <laughs> because most of you know what that means. She has the best boots and the best hats, and she's the only person that I ever served with at the altar as an acolyte who actually wore a hat during, during that, and some of you may know that. And then other best friend, my faithful sidekick here, who I'm reminded of a little plaque that I saw one time. It said, do you want to talk to the boss or the person who really knows what's going on? <laughs> And, and that's Gene, for sure. So um, now, I, I want to tell you something. We have been doing something sort of behind your back and rather secretive. But because you're both involved in administration and money, we couldn't, well, we couldn't do it secretively and give you envelopes today because we're going to have to ask you to write the check tomorrow. <laughs> but. You should see how much money has come in. We want to give you a gift from all of us as a congregation for the, your, not just your years of service, but your, just the way that you've gone about doing it. Um, neither of you have said no. And no, no matter what we ask of you, 
neither of you have said no. Well, Frances has said no a few times. Let, let me take that back. Um, and then she doesn't come to church the next Sunday. But I'm just kidding. Um, anyway, I'd, I'd like for you to each say something. So I'll start on my right. Unless, wait a minute, I'll start on my left, and then you can copy everything that's been said. I just want you all to know that these last years, more than 20, I've been with the church since I think 1998, have been the best time in my life. I love you all, and I have so enjoyed working with you, working for you, and doing whatever needs to be done. It's just been jo a joy most of the time. <laughs> So I thank you all for your kindness, for your friendship, for your generosity, for all that you give. And know that I'm going to miss you terribly in the wilds of Connecticut. <laughs> thank you. Ditto. <laughs> now, I've been here over 20 some years. I retired about 24 years, 24 years ago. And two years later, I've been here in Grace, St. Anne's, Grace, whatever it became, I became part of it. And my, what I've loved the most is serving the people of the congregation. I'm a true servant of the Lord, and I love doing things for others, more so than doing them for myself. And God has been so good to me. That's one of the reasons I love to try to give back, because I would not be here today if he hadn't been having me in his arms all these many years. And I love all of you guys and I will miss you. And my daughter's still living in my house, so I will be back sometime. We love you both. Yeah. Okay, so cake today, envelopes tomorrow. <laughs> Best wishes always. And Jean, by the way, said that she's going to attend all of our Wednesday night Bible studies from the East Coast. And they start at 7 o'clock here. So at 10 o'clock, we expect to see Jean on. And yeah, there we go. Inner, well, okay. You'll be there. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, they're, they're really, we, we, we could spend all day thanking you, but you're going to have to settle for cake. Thank you. Thank you. No. Do you want me to do the offertory? Okay. All those things up there are things that we do because you are generous in giving tithes, offerings, and almsgiving. And that little black section on the screen has three of those things, Laurie. And you, there we go, as if by magic. And if we go to the next slide, I just want to show you something. The generosity update. Here are our budget number to this point in the year, our expenses to this point in the year, and our giving to this point in the year. Now, we started out with a really healthy bank balance, and you can see that Expenses and giving are pretty close to each other. So God's been very good to us this year. And after today's sermon, he'll be even better. So I'm just kidding. So God has been really gracious and we want to thank you for your generosity. It helps us do all the things that God has called us to do. And that's the most important thing. So God bless you as you give this morning.
Lord, we thank you for these offerings and tithes, and we ask your blessing upon them and that you would give us wisdom to steward them for the sake of your kingdom, for those who are lost or far from you, God, for those who are broken and in need of healing. We pray your blessing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us reaffirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is your living word from before time and for all ages. By him, you created all things and by him, you make all things new. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. love you made us for yourself and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death you and your mercy sent your only son Jesus Christ into the world for our salvation by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary he became flesh and dwelt among us in obedience to your will he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death we might be saved by his resurrection he broke the bonds of death trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. 
But this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask for your son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we're bold to pray together. Who art in heaven, hallowed be. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Hallelujah. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. Friends, you may be seated. It is our custom to invite all those who are baptized and committed to following the teachings of Jesus to receive communion with us this morning, regardless of your church background or Christian denomination. However, if that doesn't describe where you're at, or you're coming from a faith tradition that doesn't allow you to receive with us, we still invite you to participate in this worship in a few different ways. One, you can remain in your seat, meditating on the things that you've seen and heard. Secondly, as the ushers release you row by row, you can come forward and simply put your hands over your heart, indicating that you'd like a prayer of blessing instead of receiving the bread or the wine. And thirdly, our prayer ministers will be standing in the back of the sanctuary during this time of receiving communion and worship through music. And anyone in the congregation is invited to come and receive prayer from our trained prayer ministers who would love to pray the prayers of the church for you, prayers for healing or encouragement or strengthening or whatever need that you may have. The uh, uh, bread, you can receive it and uh, uh, consume the wine in two different ways. One, you can dip it in the bowl on one side, or you can go to the chalice, the large cup, and drink from the chalice, the common cup. Uh, those are your two ways of, of receiving the wine. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
an old prayer of thanksgiving. Let's pray together. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, 
You have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 